Um, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, the issue of communication in healthcare. Let me begin by um, uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on uh, which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and allow me on all our behalf to pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. This is a very um, important and I hope for you informative webinar that we're going to host this afternoon. Um, I'll be your um, MC if you like. Um, my name is Paul Pickering. I'm the Director of the Research School of Humanities and the Arts at ANU. Um, over the course of the next uh, hour or so, um, I'll be introducing to you a number of um, expert panelists, but I'll save the introductions until um, I introduce them to you separately. In Australia alone, it's estimated that 500,000 people a year are harmed by the hospitals they go to for help. That is, they suffer from an avoidable or preventable incident caused by an event that occurred at the hospital. When these incidents are investigated, over 90% are found to have been a communication failure. These can be misunderstandings between patients and clinicians, such as a lack, a lack of clarity around a diagnosis or treatment options not being clearly understood, or illegible patient records. Or it can be omissions or failures to clarify ambiguities and conclusions in the handover period. Hundreds of patients we have interviewed have uh, say that they don't feel heard, um, that they often don't understand what is being said to them, and all too frequently they are not even part of the conversation that uh, is happening around them. And I think we've all experienced this. Uh, a couple of years ago my partner was taken ill and we sat in emergency at Canberra Hospital and uh, after a 15 minutes, someone pulled back the curtain wearing a green suit, barked a couple of questions at us, um, closed the curtains and disappeared. Didn't even tell us his name. Could have been the janitor. So at that stage, I really realized that there was an issue here. And um, shortly afterwards, I met Di Slade, who gave me an inspiring story about the work that she um, and others are doing. And you'll hear from Di and those people today. So let me invite you to join a panel of experts from across the ANU to find out about their multidisciplinary and innovative approach to addressing the issue of healthcare communication and by so doing, improving the quality and safety of their uh, patients. So our first presenter is Shushoka Keshkesh, who is acting director of the ANU Medical School um, and a senior staff specialist um, in the Department of Neontology at Canberra Hospital. So let me ask you, um, uh, uh, Shizhoka, um, as I stated, there's been um, the suggestion that thousands or even tens of thousands of patients suffer from avoidable incidents. Surely it can't be that much. And can you explain this uh, situation to us in some more detail? Yeah, thank you, Paul, would love to. So first of all, let's talk about language. When we talk about critical incidents, what we're really talking about are medical errors. And a medical error is a preventable adverse event for the patient. Um, could be evident or not, could be harmful or not. You've already given some examples, but imagine somebody's getting a wrong drug or wrong dosage or given the drug uh, per mouth when it should have been in the vein or the wrong blood transfusion. It could be a misdiagnosis, over-treatment, under-treatment, wrong site surgery, a fall, a burn, pressure, injury, any of those. Now you just stated that they happen in hospitals, but they don't just happen in hospitals, they happen in general practices and in community practices as well. And to give you an idea of the size of the problem, we now think that medical error is the third most common cause of death in the US after heart disease and uh, cancer. And it causes death anywhere depending on what reports you read or believe. There's still a lot of non-believers out there, um, but may cause up to 100,000 to 800,000 deaths. We think that most of them would be preventable. 
And if you really look down, um, as you've already stated, most commonly, the problem is miscommunication. So how can poor communication be the cause, really? Um, can you perhaps give us some examples of that? Yeah, so if you think of medicine, it's a little bit like aviation. So historically, the health of a patient or the safety of a patient, we thought, lay in the hands of the individual, you know, the very well-trained doctor or the expert nurse with um, his or her clinical skills. However, we now know, um, anybody who's been in hospital, and as you've just described, Paul, that really the care is delivered in teams. Um, yet the teams, so think nurses or think doctors, all train in isolation, you know, medical schools, nursing schools, allied health schools. And we don't really practice teamwork and communication. So I just mentioned aviation, and there was a big problem in the 70s. Those of you who are old enough to remember, there were a lot of planes falling out of the sky, a lot of patients, sorry, <laughs> patients, uh, a, lot, a lot of passengers dying. It was rather spectacular when a plane falls out of the sky. So. Aviation has realized that communication is a problem. And they now do that. They do that very well. They look at human errors. They talk and train communication, leadership, decision-making, and so on. And we don't really do that. Um, we assume that the leader, which is often to be seen to either be the senior nurse or the senior doctor, knows what they're doing, and everybody else falls in line. But that's not what happens. So you asked for some, some examples. So let me give them to you. So if somebody has, a let's say, a cardiac arrest and needs to be saved with drugs, we often say, give me two of adrenaline. What's that mean? Two mils, two milligrams, two ampules. Think about written instructions. You know, the radiologist that writes a cancer report and a chest x-ray phones that through to somebody and then thinks that was it, writes it down, but nobody looks at the written report until the patient represents, for instance. Handel was a particular difficult um, part where care is really transferred from one clinical person to the next, nurses, between doctors, between shifts and so on. And if somebody just forgets to mention the penicillin allergy or that the patient is demented or speaks a different language, we have a problem. Uh, details that are missing, I've already mentioned. Um, how do you express concerns from the patient or the carers to the, to the clinician when you don't really know how to say that you're worried about somebody who's getting sicker and think about end of life, how difficult is that? Who actually has those discussions in what kind of language with whom at what time? So look, if communication, a poor communication is the problem causing patient harm or even death, um, why, why aren't we doing something about it? Yeah, so we are, actually are. <laughs> so in the first instance, we're realizing it, right? Um, we're a bit behind, but uh, we're getting there. And with more and more evidence, really, and that's why the research that Di Slade and her team are doing is so important, with more evidence coming out and describing the effects, not just on patient safety, but really on patient and team satisfaction, as the story that you just told um, shows, um, the better the outcomes are. But there's some barriers there, and the barriers are, think of all the complexity and the volume of information that has to be transferred from shift to shift or from hospital to the GP practice or the community centres. Think of um, the IT difficulties that we have, because none of the IT systems, of course, talk to each other. Think the patients that may speak English in Australia, but do not understand medical language. And that's not even looking at people whose uh, first language isn't English. Um, and it's really about hurdles that we have in, in upgrading new communication systems. So there's a whole range of systems that need to be addressed, and I can't comment on them all. Um, but uh, teamwork and addressing them and knowing about them is a very good first step. Thanks very much, uh, Shushoka. Um, but before I uh, go to our next panellist, I should have pointed out at the beginning that this webinar is being recorded and that if you have questions during the uh, webcast, please submit them through the Q&A function. So, uh, our second panellist uh, today is uh, Professor Di Slade. Di is the director of the ANU Institute for Communication in Healthcare. Um, Di, can you, um, as you're the director of our institute, um, can you tell us what it is and what's it trying to achieve? Yes, thanks, Paul. Well, Paul and Jujuka have both mentioned the impact of critical incidents caused by communication failures. Now, there have been many excellent international policy initiatives to try to improve healthcare communication, but despite these, there is little evidence that communication practices around the world are becoming safer. 
There's also a lack of evidence-based research and data on why and how communication failures are happening. So in 2018, we launched the ANU Institute for Communication and Healthcare. It's an international interdisciplinary research institute bringing together linguists with academic and health-related professionals, such as doctors, nurses, and allied health. Now, why do you think linguists can help? Most of our experiences of healthcare are through language. That is, we can't really do healthcare except through language. So it makes sense that so much of what goes wrong is with the communication process. Communicating care effectively is essential, we would argue, for delivering safe, quality care. So we believe that what, is necessary, what was needed was an interdisciplinary approach with linguists or people who understand language and communication, the outsider perspective, collaborating with healthcare professionals, the insider perspective. Now, there are two of the dimensions of the Institute I'll briefly, I'll briefly mention that I think differentiates it from many other institutes focusing on healthcare. The first dimension is we do predominantly qualitative research on communication in hospital contexts. We, to investigate human interactions and behaviour change, a qualitative approach is critical. A quantitative approach, for example, cannot answer such questions as how might people communicate more effectively to improve the safety and quality of healthcare? So how do we, in our qualita predominantly qualitative way, explore questions like this? We not only do extensive interviews, which is very typical of ethnographic research, but where our research is unusual, is that we audio and video record many hours of actual hospital interactions. This is important because what people say they do in interviews is very different than what they actually do. And analyzing the recorded hospital interactions, whether they be clinician patient or clinician clinician, it allows us to identify potential risk points through the patient's journey that could jeopardize patient safety. Now the second dimension is that our approach lends itself to translation into practice. In each of the Institute's projects, we use the authentic, de-identified hospital interactions and the detailed analyses of the data as the basis of reenacted verbatim videos, communication protocols and training materials. So can you give us an example of, um, a more specific example uh, perhaps of what the impact of the centre's research has been. Thanks, Paul. I'll just give you an example of a recent project that we've done with St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney on nursing handovers. Now, as you can mention handover, clinical handover is perhaps the most critical communicative event that occurs in hospitals. It's estimated that there are over, this is an interesting figure, that there are over 50 million shift to shift handovers per year in Australian hospitals, whether that be nursing, medical, allied health. Every one of these handovers represents a chance of miscommunication. So a few years ago, state health departments mandated that at least some of the handovers should happen at the bedside, as involving the patient in the handover process is shown to improve patient satisfaction and safety. So we were asked to go into a particular ward of St. Joseph's, uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, and work with the nurses and ward managers to improve the nursing handover practices, in particular, looking at the transition to bedside handover. So what did we do? We collected a lot of data, including staff and patient interviews, focus groups, extensive observations, but, and critically, we audio and video record recordings of the actual handover events. What did we find? The data collection revealed extensive inefficiencies with nursing handover practices and lack of interaction with both patients and nurses meant that misunderstandings, failures and error in, errors in communication were not fixed. So we made extensive recommendations on system and ward level changes to improve the handover practices. And then we trained the nurses and management in how to conduct effective and inclusive handovers. What was exciting about this project was that the post-intervention evaluation showed a significant increase in patient satisfaction and a decrease in a range of reported healthcare associated complications. So comparing the post-intervention period to the average of the previous three years, there was a 52% reduction in inpatient falls, a 22% reduction decrease in the number of newly acquired pressure injuries and a 21% reduction in the number of medication errors. So look, what do we learn from this project? There are two key factors that we believe enable meaningful, impactful and sustainable change. 
Firstly, support and collaboration with clinician and management at all levels of the hospital is crucial. At St. Vincent's Hospital, we had extraordinary support from the wonderful um, nurse unit manager, the director of nursing, the, and right across the, the hospital. And secondly, training is not enough. It must, I really have learnt now, we've learnt now that it must be accompanied by ward and system level changes. In other words, improving communication practices in a ward changes the culture of that ward, and only then does the intervention result in sustainable change. As a result of the success of the, this project, we've been funded by, by a generous gift from the Hanby Family Trust and St. Vincent's Hospital Curran Foundation to extend this translational research across the St. Vincent's Hospital Network in Sydney and Melbourne. I'd just like to say in summary for my little bit is that this, the, we believe it's the confluence of factors, ANU's extraordinary support of this area and encouragement of interdisciplinary research, the support of hospitals such as St. Vincent's Hospital Network and also over many years, the Canberra Hospital and our wonderful colleagues at ANU and around the world, positions us well to help contribute to a future where health, healthcare is safe, compassionate and supportive for patients, carers and clinicians. Thanks, Thank you very much, Di. Um, as I mentioned before, um, Di is the director of our ANU Institute for Communication in Healthcare. Our next panellist is uh, Professor Imogen Mitchell. Um, Imogen is director of the ANU Medical School. She's an intensive care specialist at Canberra Hospital um, and clinical director of the ACT COVID-19 response. Uh, Imogen. Can I ask you, um, what are the most challenging parts of the communication exchange in having end of life conversations um, with uh, patients. I think you're muted there, Imogen. You may not be able to hear me. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Excellent. Um, well, as you might know, there are going to be two certainties in life. One is paying taxes, and the other one is that we're all going to die. Now, very few of us will know um, when we're going to die, but how we die remains in the memory of those that are going to be around us as we die. And that's going to be very critical in terms of, as I say, for families and carers as to how that might be as a good or bad experience. Um, now, some of us will have absolutely no control when we die, how we die, because it might be catastrophic. But some of us actually will be able to plan uh, where we are, who will be with us, and what things will be important to us at the end. Now, the trouble is, none of these things can happen unless someone talks to us about what it is that we want at the end and how we tease out those critical facts. Uh, and of course, you could do that through uh, an advanced care plan. But if we ask ourselves how many on the panel have an advanced care plan, I suspect very few of us, and in fact, a lot of data will say that only 12% of us in Australia have a documented plan of how and what sort of things will be important to us as we die. So that then brings me to a challenge. As an intensive care specialist, as you can appreciate, I will have come across dying patients from time to time, and certainly a lot over the last 20 odd years. And so what happens is I find myself talking to families about their loved ones and their dying process. And yet these families are not equipped to understand what is important to their loved ones because they haven't talked about it. So of course that means that these conversations with family members is incredibly challenging. It's not only challenging for the family members, but it's very challenging as an intensive care doctor as well. Because very few will have spoken about death and what's important to them at the time of dying. So what that then means is that the families are now second guessing as to what is going to be important because often the patient is way too confused to get any sensible conversation going. So having had the experience of intensive care over the last 20 years, I actually have had the privilege of being with families at this incredibly difficult time. As a trainee in intensive care, I'm not sure if I recall learning from a great master of communication. However, I do know, having had a social worker tell me that I have a certain recipe, which we could, I guess, in an academic way, call a framework of talking with families at this really difficult time. 
but the challenge I have is I don't know whether this is a framework that's right or wrong. So that then led me to thinking how might I, I guess, strengthen my communication skills or not. And so that's when I started to connect with uh, Professor Dyslade and her group of linguists. Um, and so through a small grant, I then worked with Dye's team uh, on a small project, recording not only myself, but other intensive care doctors um, during these family conversations. And uh, I think to start with, I was going to be a bit nervous as I was you know, being recorded, but actually over time it became, I hardly noticed the recording machine. These transcripts are then meticulously analysed, and that has now led to a number of recommendations, including the use of a communication protocol. And it's these protocols that can now be used by training intensive care doctors. So if we think about what that protocol might look like, there are actually two approaches to the conversation. The first part of it is purely an informational exchange uh, strategy, so that we break down the conversation into bite-sized chunks, such that you, you open up the conversation, you provide an overview of what's been happening, and then you start to share knowledge in a way that's easily understandable to the listener. And that then, of course, leads to a shared decision. Now, there might be some negotiation through that decision-making, but in the end, you land on a way forward. The other thing that will have to happen as well is that you have to also build up the relationship. And often I've never met these families before, but during the whole uh, conversation piece, it's really important to get those interpersonal connections strengthened so that you know that the quality of the conversation is going to be much, much better. So what one needs to demonstrate throughout your conversations with the families is you demonstrating compassion and sympathy, as well as cultural sympathy, and an inclusive sense to the conversation so that everyone in the room needs to feel that they are important as part of the conversation. And then of course, sometimes quite challenging, you need to manage expectations because the expectations may be different between family members but they also may be different between the healthcare workers and the families as well. And they need to be managed very, very tactfully um, so that uh, you've got a cohesive way forward. So I think for me, the learning piece out of this small project is to help me understand you know, what I was doing right, potentially where I could strengthen so that not only I, but other intensive care doctors can have a better conversation so that families and more importantly, the patient have a better experience at the end of their life. Thanks very much, Imogen. Um, our next panelist is uh, Professor Christine Phillips. Um, she is Professor of Social Foundations of Medicine at the ANU Medical School, uh, Medical Director of Companion House Refugee Medical Service and Director of the ANU Health Answers Translational Partnership. Um, can I ask you, Chris, um, Australia, of course, is a multicultural country with a great deal of linguistic diversity. How does this impact on the safety of clinical conversations? Thanks, Paul. What a great question. I, um, I'm going to begin by pointing out that uh, as you said, Australia is a hugely linguistically diverse country. In fact, 250 languages are spoken in this country. Having said that, having demonstrated that we, we are among the most, we're the eighth most linguistically diverse country in the world, uh, most of us can only speak English. Three out of four of us only speak English. They're like me, they're monolingual. So that makes us the third most monolingual country in the world. So the problem is not just people who are not, uh, uh, is, is not just our linguistically diversity, it's actually the uh, long, long consequences of a lack of a language policy in this country, which has meant that we actually are overwhelmingly monolingual. And that means that almost all healthcare communication occurs in English because that is the lingua franca. So that is a very risky situation. We tend to think of the major risks in relation to people who uh, cannot speak English or have limited English facility 
as being related around the three C's. So that is around complexity. And I think you've heard a lot of complex healthcare discussions mentioned today. Consent, and uh, we really need to be very clear that somebody has given consent to a procedure before they have that procedure, because otherwise that's a legal assault. Uh, and competence. And the competence is not just uh, is the patient competent to make those decisions, but it is also uh, is the linguistic support that we have competent as well. And I have over many years of working in this field have seen story after story of the wrong people or inappropriate people being pressed into service as the, the linguistic support. Uh, in one occasion, a 14-year-old was asked to interpret the trauma history for his father. In another occasion, we were familiar with the processes in hospitals of getting the person who works in, the, in, in, the, in another setting, the cleaner perhaps, to come in and interpret. All of those are completely inappropriate. And when they do that, we increase the risk that something will go very, very awry. So what, what sort of more formal um, link linguistic communication supports are there and available? Well, the, uh, the, AA, uh, the Australia has, uh, um, has probably the best linguistic support through the translating and interpreting uh, service, which is run by the Department of Home Affairs and has been since the 1970s, uh, to provide rapid access uh, in interpreting to private doctors and also to doctors in the public sector. And, to pharmacists and to a number of other people in the health sector. Now that ranks with SBS as Australia's great contribution to multicultural Australia. Now you may say, Paul, well, that's great. How often is it actually used? In fact, we now know there have been several studies confirming this, that for every hundred patients who have limited facility with English, only one of them has an interpreter for their consultation. And that is in Australia, which has the world's most act accessible, free interpreter service. We are, there's no other country that will get you an interpreter in one of 250 languages at three minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And yet it's used in only one in 10 consultations. It's, it's quite amazing that uh, that support has been available for such a long period of time. Of course, we're in a period where there's rapid developments in communication technology. Um, we talked about My Health Online and, and so forth. So I'm wondering if, if are there any machine apps that are being developed? And if not, why, uh, if there are, how could we use them? Right. Well, I think everybody who's actually turned on their phone now is familiar with some of the very available machine apps and, and the most prominent of which is Google Translate. Google Translate went through a, a massive change in its platform a couple of years ago and rapidly expanded the kinds of languages that were available for its machine translation facility. And it's been used, I'm sure that many people in, the, in this webinar have used that already on their holidays or when talking to somebody in another language. The question to our mind is how safe is that and how good is that in a medical consultation, which is a far more complex consultation. I have a couple of concerns. One of the concerns is that it's completely open. It's actually a bit like having a consultation on a street corner, that it's open to whoever wants to listen into it. But the other issue, and an issue that I've worked with my great colleague, Susie McQueen from, from the Institute, is, on, is around the issue of consent and whether Google Translate in these high stakes medical consultations will in fact help or hinder and at the moment, the jury, uh, the, the jury is out, but we've done some research, but there is very strong um, push from uh, government to not use it until we have that data on safety. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Um, and that's a perfect segue for me to follow up with your colleague and co-researcher, uh, Dr. Susie McQueen, who's uh, done some more specialist work in um, on Google Translate. Susie is a senior lecturer in our School of um, Linguistics, Languages and Literature here at ANU. Um, and as I say, she's been using or working on Google Translate in health consultations. Um, Susie, can you tell us what you're finding? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, 
this project, as Chris mentioned, is um, one that arose because um, Chris and her colleagues had observed an increasing use of Google Translate in healthcare contexts. And it also was gathering a presence in the literature to suggest that it that it may be okay. And so we decided to put Google Translate to the test, but we wanted to test it well. And we decided that we would um, test it in the wild, as it were, uh, with a variety of accents and using spoken language in actual um, consultations. So we uh, used role plays between doctors and patients. And um, this was important rather than having, testing it, you know, just using isolated We've lost you a bit there. Susie, can you hear us? I said, okay, now am I back? Uh huh. Yeah, you sounded like a Dalek for a little while, but you're back. <laughs> this is one of the pitfalls of technology, actually. It's kind of um, appropriate that I, I did go Dalek just then. Um, so uh, we chose to test Google Translate in informed consent interactions um, and we chose to use it with obstetricians seeking informed consent from patients who had low English proficiency um, for uh, caesarean section surgery. Now this kind of conversation is really high stakes as Chris just mentioned because if it goes wrong there are serious consequences. Linguistically, these kinds of interactions are really interesting because they're extremely tricky. You have special terms related to the procedure, which may have multiple meanings in English. So I'm thinking of terms like delivery or labour or complications. Um, but you also have these terms used in the language of risk, which itself is quite complex. You encounter things like there is less than 5% risk of infection or complex structures such as if there was damage to your internal organs, this would be repaired. And of course, modal verbs, words like could, may and might, and these are inherently ambiguous words, so really quite tricky to translate. And what we found to get to your question um, is that in the first instance, both the patients and the obstetricians left the consultation thinking that they had been completely understood. There was something really quite convincing about Google Translate. Um, but it was only once we had the Google Translations back translated by human translators that it became clear that some critical things had been missed, um, which would really actually call into question whether the, con the consent was actually informed. So, of course, you know, humans can miss things and make mistakes as well. But with a human translator, there's less chance of this happening because humans are simply better at picking up contextual cues and cultural cues and at negotiating meaning when something goes wrong. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Susie. Um, so, do you think these technologies are making any difference um, in relation to the quality of patient care? Um, well, I think that they're, they're, they're having an effect because they seem to be um, quite widespread. But if I can give you an example of how, um, how much risk there could be with uh, using this technology or relying on this technology rather than a human. Um, in our trial, we had two women who had prior caesareans and they repeatedly tried to convey this information to the obstetricians but the information wasn't recoverable from what Google Translate had given them. An instance, um, the uh, patient already um, from her prior cesarean had a vertical scar and she wanted to know whether having a horizontal cut with her second cesarean would be okay. So in asking this, Google Translate said, I would like to confirm that my cesarean section is a vertical cut this time. You can cut the cutting. And now something like this is really difficult to recover the meaning from. Um, and in this instance, the um, obstetrician actually thought that she was talking about future cesareans. So she reassured the patient there'd only be one horizontal scar, it was fine. Not realizing at the time that the patient actually already had a vertical scar. And the obstetrician said that she would actually have done this consultation quite differently had she known. 
So, you know, we can be forgiving since translation is complex and, of course, human translators make mistakes too. But in this case, the patient had tried to communicate this, type, this information seven times and each time the information was mangled or missed. So, um, I would be reluctant to suggest uh, uh, that Google Translate should be widespread, um, certainly before uh, more, uh, it becomes better quality in, the, in these really high stakes spoken interactions. Thanks, Susie. Um, so now turn to our final uh, panelist before we have some question time. And um, that is uh, Associate Professor Hannah Sumanen, who is um, a, a senior lecturer, Associate Professor in, the, um, in Computer Science in the ANU College of uh, engineering and computer science. Um, Hannah, can you describe or share with us some highlights from the work on developing technologies to help record and transcribe clinical handovers to be inserted in electronic health records? Thanks, Paul. Sure, I can tell. So we have learned as part of this panel that good communication is really critical in healthcare. We have learned about mistakes that happen there uh, and had good examples also about where technology can go wrong. Uh, what my work has contributed to is computer assisted workflows as a way to deliver increasingly efficient and effective healthcare. So what this work consists of is giving little microphones and digital voice recorders, tablets, smartphones, or something of that kind to nurses. Then we have recorded their spoken handover. So now we are talking about shift change handover in hospitals. So we have recorded their conversation. Then we have used automated speech recognition to transcribe that spoken language into written freeform text. Uh, and this actually works surprisingly well. So it can achieve up to 90%, so 90% correctness, with just a few minutes um, to allow the speech recognition engine to understand a given nurse's way of speaking. So it's not very different from what you experienced probably a minute or two ago when I started speaking and you started hearing and adjusting your ear to my way of speaking English. Money didn't speak here either because the secret ingredient in this was just a $15 microphone that is noise cancelling. So it's cancelling the surrounding noise there. Finally, we applied automated text classification to this speech recognized text to fill out a nursing handover form with snippets of text that are extracted from there, from the freeform text into a form. Um, it performed also really well, so it was excellent in filtering out information that should not go in that form. And for about 20% of the headings, the classifier's correctness was about 90% or more. And this 90% number is the rule of thumb that the system would be useful in practice. Okay, so let me put you on the spot then. Do these technologies, in your view, make a difference to the quality of patient care? That's a really difficult and insightful um, question, Paul. So when these technologies are appropriately connected to the nurse's workflow, what Di was mentioning was the culture. So we need to really look into the culture at the ward these technologies could help by releasing staff members' time from documentation to more meaningful and joyful tasks, such as discussing with patients or other family members or other direct caring tasks. Why I emphasize this is that this would give nurses and other healthcare professionals more space to do their critical role of caring and interacting with patients. And what I mean by saying appropriately, I mean that the workflow should really happen there in real time so that the nurses get straight away a drafted transcript and the form straight away so that they can do the proofreading there at the bedside, uh, revise the text if that's needed, revise the form if that's needed and sign out the document to be added in the health record. They also should have visual interactive 
interface or tools so that they can do this proofreading and editing task as easy as possible so that the right information is shown in its actual original context and editing is as easy as possible. And my final point here would be that not taking the utility of technologies of this kind is a decision as well and that kind of decision has consequences. Although we need a lot more work across disciplines and professions um, to make the technologies safe and usable, useful, something that we can transfer from research to practice, I think that they can really improve communication in healthcare. And I would like to take the opportunity to emphasize this argument with an example case. So Paul, you have done an excellent job in asking questions from me. So now I will have a trivia question for you. So are you ready? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so let us assume that you are there in a hospital ward as a patient and the nurses are trying to have a handover discussion and trying to record it. And we are wanting to know that if we assume again that this handover conversation has been perfect, it has been accurate and comprehensive, everything's perfect in the verbal communication, how many shift changes or days do you think, Paul, that it will take until we start to lose information in a severe way? So what I mean with severe is that 75% or more of this information gets lost. So how many days or shift changes would it take? Well, <clears throat> Hannah, I wasn't expecting questions. Um, I'm supposed to be asking them, but that's a really challenging one. I guess I'm placing a lot of faith in communication. I'm saying it would take a long time before that information was lost. That's a good answer, Paul. Thanks for trying. Um, on the other hand, we heard earlier that packs like milliliters or grams or amples get confused quickly and those lead to severe problems. So the right answer is that it doesn't take more than a day or two. So from three to five shift changes until the information is really severely lost. And this is the case if no electronic tool is being used. So if we just write by pen and paper or don't take notes at all. So I really think that the technologies could help here. Well, thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you to all our uh, panellists. Um, we have time for some questions, um, and there's been quite a number of them um, that popping up on my Q&A screen here. So let me ask, and let me open this to all of the panel, anyone on the panel who wants to jump in and answer it. Um, what do you see is the role for health policy staff? And improving communication in healthcare for patients. I'm sure the um, medical um, people on this um, panel would be better answering this, but I, I could just start by saying a few things. That health policy is absolutely critical, and but the but I'll just and, and so staff implementing or so staff formulating health policy is really important. To give you an example, the Australian Commission for the Quality and Safety of Healthcare that um, is is um, is a very, very important policy making body in Australia. The issue is though, how are those policies effectively implemented in the hospital context? I'll give you a couple of, and also do staff know them about them? Do they conform to them? Are there, is there any training? For one example, the Australian Commission's national, they've got national standards, six communicating for patient safety mandates that at least one of the nursing handovers and some medical are done by the, at the bedside, the afternoon one in particular, but it also mandates that training happens. Yet with the, when we, we've gone into these hospitals and done, and, and, and done the training, that is the first training that anyone says they've had, except a, one very brief online course, which doesn't, seem to work, which doesn't seem to have had any impact. Same with patient-centered care. That's a, pol a policy around the world um, for most health departments around the world. But 
what does that mean? Does it, how is that enacted in communicative practices? So what I would argue is there's an enormous gap between policy and practice. The policies are great, but they need a lot more funding for training, a lot more for professional development to actually enact those, um, to get those policies realised in practice. Uh, thanks, Di. Um, another question from our um, audience. Again, anyone on the panel wants to jump in. Um, this is, in terms of protocols around such complex conversations, to what extent is it also important to allow individual clinicians to develop their own style to ensure authenticity? Tough question. I'm happy to give it, I'm happy to say something, but I'll, I promise I'll shut up after this. But the, I think in terms of protocols, they are, they're just guides. And so I would argue for junior doctors, for junior nurses, junior allied health, there are particular contexts where those, as Imogen was talking about with intensive care and the very complex situation of end of life care and end of life conversations, they are, they are protocols that can guide why people are becoming, in a sense, mentored into that discipline, why they're junior becoming experts in that discipline, I think they can be very useful. I would also argue that they are much more useful if they're based on an analysis and understanding of what really goes on. So I think if they contain authentic examples of what's actually said, because a lot of them are very general. So they say things like, be empathetic. Well, what does empathetic mean? You know, I mean, people, everyone would like to be empathetic, but it's actually how is that realised in particular, particular ways of communicating? So I would argue it doesn't destroy creativity because as you get more experience, you, um, are, you, you do do have your individual variation, but it's very useful. And also for, for, there's an increasing number of non-English speaking background clinicians. And I think protocols, the feedback that I've had with, um, is, is better that they are very useful, in the, especially in the early days. Well, thanks, Di. And this next question, I think, is particularly for Chris. Um, and that is, Chris, do we know why the free interpreter service is so underused? Oh, such a good question. Um, I, I, I would, uh, it, it has been uh, noted around the world because nowhere else in the world is an, a ready, an interpreter service for clinicians so readily available. If in other countries, there's often a, a statement, well, what you have to do is make it available 24 hours a day, or you have to remove the price controls. And if you did that, then it would be available, but it is free here and underused. So our research into, into that suggests that there are a couple of intersecting problems. That one of them is that uh, people are unfamiliar with the systems of getting a telephone interpreter. And so that's why one of the driving factors that we've used a lot in primary general practice, at least over the last few years, has been to make it part of the accreditation system, that you have to be able to know how to get an interpreter. But secondly, uh, there are most interpreting telephone, uh, most medical interpreting is done by phone. We have to do that in this country because we're so spread out and we uh, have so many languages. It's not possible to say only, we will only do on-site interpreting because that's the best form. And many clinicians cling to this idea that the best form of interpreting is in person. And if we do that, then we actually will radically underuse interpreters because there's no way that we will be able to have at short notice accessible interpreters in 250 languages. So I think those two things interact. I think there's um, uh, a, a um, a need to keep pushing this in, in education and keep pushing this in, in institutions. And also for people who may use interpreters, who may or whose family members are, push it yourself. That doctor is supposed to provide you with an interpreter. It's actually their obligation. They are medico-legally compromised if they don't. So you say, get me an interpreter. I know that you can do it in three minutes. Do it. Okay, so um, there's a good follow-up question here then that perhaps you might want to answer or, or Susie, um, and that is, but uh, someone asks, well, don't patients prefer their relative to interpret because they feel more comfortable? Um, isn't that what you'd call patient-centred care? Yeah, so uh, I've certainly had that case, uh, that comment made to me by, by lots of people over a, a decade and a half of teaching in this area that... Uh, 
um, patients actually prefer to have their own family members. Now that's often stated without actually any uh, actual evidence. It's just stated that they prefer it. The evidence base for whether they really do prefer is, is not strong. And um, I think it's on a case by case basis. But the important thing that, that I always say in teaching is that it actually isn't the patient that needs the interpreter. We always say that needs an interpreter. But actually, it's the clinician that needs the interpreter. The clinician is the one who can't communicate. So if it looks like it's a high stakes a consultation, particularly, then and we know that there is a, a very available interpreter service that could be used, then the clinician should have that conversation with the patient about getting an interpreter. I've done 7,000 interpreter consultations in my clinical life, and I have had on about three occasions somebody say, I don't want to do that. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, again, another changing tack slightly here. This is a, a difficult one for you, Hannah, and that is how long do you think it will take before speech recognition gets used uh, routinely as part of healthcare? Well, that is a difficult question because it's not in the hands of us researchers and I represent research side myself. Uh, it requires changes in healthcare practice, probably changes in policy as well. Um, so it's a tricky question to answer. However, the twist here is that, for example, in Norway, they have used clinical speech recognition routinely already for more than five years in their university hospitals and the technologies are not being evaluated anymore because they are part of the process. They are part of normal life like we now do these Zoom discussions. Thanks, Hannah. Um, okay, so uh, here's another interesting question. Uh, um, uh, someone asks, uh, what are the legal implications if someone suffers harm as a result of um, poor communication. For example, if a friend or family member mistranslated information which resulted um, in an injury, or if a healthcare worker was shown to have not given clear enough instructions, the, the two ampules or milligrams or uh, getting those things confused, who actually is liable in these circumstances? Can I answer the language question? So uh, we know that there's, there's, there's good tort law in Australia that says the person who's liable in that case is the doctor. So, um, and the reason that they are liable is because there was an alternative in the interpreter service. They might not have been liable in another country that didn't have the accessibility service, but in this country, um, if you are relying upon a, 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 a um, family member to communicate something that really matters. The particular case here was a, a, a woman who uh, went to a GP with a swollen leg and the GP correctly thought, oh, that looks like a deep vein thrombosis. You should go to the emergency department. So the GP wrote a letter and said to the lady, um, uh, you should go to the emergency department. And she indicated that she would go to the emergency department with it. But instead she went home and she waited for her daughter who spoke better English than she did to come home and take it to the hospital. But she actually died at home. She had a, a clot that went into her lungs and she died. And the court was very clear that the, the person who was at fault in this case was the doctor who did not, who should have assessed that the lady didn't understand and should have used an interpreter because it was a high stakes consultation and she needed to know she needed to go to the hospital. Okay, so what if the miscommunication then, perhaps is for the rest of the panel, what if the miscommunication comes from the doctor or the, the um, nurse or another healthcare professional? Who is liable then? Chris, it looks like it's you still. Is anyone able to answer? Paul, I can. Oh, Shizuka happens all the time, has nothing to do with even different languages because medicine is its own language. And I think in the end, the buck stops with the person who communicates whatever needs to be done and whether that the instructions or asking questions about their health. In the end, it is um, the, the health clinician's job to ensure that um, we understand what the patient says, but more importantly, what the patient understands 
what we say. And that's really difficult. You know, that word health, health literacy comes to mind because um, medicine is so complicated. And as uh, I think Susie outlined in, uh, you know, just words like delivery and risk um, all have in the English language many and multiple meanings and can be misunderstood. Sure. Thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about um, patient um, healthcare professional interactions. Um, what about communication between healthcare professionals? Um, how is there work being done on improving that to make sure that things are being passed on from shift to shift and how that's being done? Yeah, Paul, I can help a little bit with that because, you know, I, I, I really talked about systems. Um, but communication, just like anything else, needs to be practiced. <clears throat> just like we practice walking when we're little or play a sport or whatever. Not. So there's some frameworks for certain types of communication that happen all the time. Think, uh, as Di just spoke about, the handover. So there's a, a, a way to hand over that, that, that's using the ISBA model, introduction, situation, background, assessment, recommendation. This is actually a model developed by the American Navy. And I mean, if they can hand over a whole warship in, in a few minutes, I don't know why we can't hand over a patient. Um, we talked about escalating concerns and their models there. They're called CUS, where you outline your concerns. If you're unsure, you know, it's about safety and stop. So they're all out there, but we don't practice them. And particularly, we don't practice them between health professionals. And uh, if anybody wants to look them up, they're actually a really good way to practice at home with your family and your friends. That's how you get into the swing of it. <laughs> Thanks, Shizuka. Look, there's over 20 questions waiting in line, but actually we're pressing right up against time. Um, so again, uh, I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking the panel speakers from across the ANU. Um, I should get a plug in for ANU here and say that um, not only do we host the Institute, but we also teach in our wonderful linguistics department um, some of the uh, uh, courses in relation to uh, healthcare communication. And I guess for me, it's difficult to think of an applied research area based in the humanities that has a more direct, immediate impact on the health and well being of our citizens. Um, what you've heard today is of wonderfully talented and dedicated professionals working in an interdisciplinary partnership. Um, medical researchers, linguists, healthcare professionals, communication specialists, computer scientists, all of whom are making a difference. So I'm, I'm really excited to close the um, uh, webinar today by announcing that we have recently established an ANU-led international consortium for communication in healthcare. Now this links the ANU Institute with key international centers um, in this region and around the world. Uh, just let me list the organizational partners to give you a sense of how important this is being taken as an issue globally. They are University College London, Lancaster University, Hong Kong University, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, um, uh, Harvard and Queensland University of Technology. Now this consortium um, which we're delighted to have helped uh, establish and to uh, support um, is really some of the world's great universities tackling through cutting edge research a global problem. Um, and of course we're delighted going forward at ANU to be able to provide a base to help this consortium flourish into the future. And we would like you to join us for our next webinar with the directors of each of these centres around the world, um, which will be held on September the 23rd at 5pm. And further details will be available in, in due course. So, um, I uh, again would like to thank our participants um, um, and our panellists have given their time and I think um, done a wonderful job and to thank you all for joining us um, and we'll hope to see you again on the 23rd. Thanks very much. Thank you Paul.